Please welcome to the stage the CEO of Confederation Center of the Arts, Steve Bellamy. Kuei, good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 Simons Medal presentation and lecture. Bonjour et bienvenue à la remise de médailles et conférence Simons 2023. En l'honneur de notre Lieutenant Gouverneur, son honneur Antoinette Perry, je vous prie de vous lever pour la salut vie, vice royale. Please join me in recognizing her honor, Lieutenant Governor Antoinette Perry. Please rise for the vice regal salute. Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. Veuillez porter votre attention vers l'écran pour l'introduction de l'événement de cet après-midi. Please turn your attention to the screen for the introduction of this afternoon's event. Welcome to the 2023 Simons Medal Presentation and Lecture on the State of Canadian Confederation, proudly presented annually at Confederation Center of the Arts. Awarded to Canadians who have made outstanding contributions to our country. Previous recipients include Mary Simon, Dr. David Suzuki, the Honorable Murray Sinclair, the Honorable Bob Ray. The Honorable Louise Arbour. And Sheila Rogers. A total of 23 recipients have been granted the award, hailing from coast to coast to coast. The Simon Ceremony is held in the birthplace of Confederation to mark the anniversary of the Charlottetown Conference of 1864. Since long before that historic meeting, Prince Edward Island has been known as Epiquit to the Mi'kmaq people, who have lived here for more than 10,000 years. We proudly move forward together in the spirit of reconciliation and to continue the ongoing conversation of an evolving Canada. Since 2004, the Simons Lecture Series has provided a national platform for diverse and distinguished Canadians to share their thoughts on the current state of Confederation, giving all Canadians the opportunity to reflect upon our country and its future. Named in honor of the late Professor Thomas Simons, a visionary and founding president of Trent University, Professor Simons was widely recognized for his contributions in the areas of public policy, heritage, and education. Since Canada's Confederation, this nation has continued to evolve with a desire to become a better country. The 2023 Simons Medal recipient is writer, historian, former politician, and one of Canada's most esteemed academics, Michael Ignatieff. His lecture, Canada in the World, Hope, Optimism, and the Human Project, explores issues such as the climate crisis and artificial intelligence, and asks how we can revive hope in the human project in the face of these and other challenges.
Along with Her Honor, Antoinette Perry, I'd like to recognize the Honorable Dennis King, Premier of Prince Edward Island, and His Worship, Philip Brown, Mayor of Charlottetown. It means a great deal to all of us every time you're able to join us here at the Center. I'd also like to offer a warm welcome to Simons medalist Michael Ignatieff and his wife, Susanna Zohar. Welcome to Charlottetown. There are several elected officials, uh, center board staff, center board members, staff members, uh, and many other VIPs in the room. Too many to name. I wish I could name you all, but I will just say welcome. We're grateful that you've given time to this, this event. Many, many people were involved bringing this event to you today. On behalf of the center, I'd like to express my gratitude to all staff here at the center for their work and members of the Simons Medal Committee who are volunteers and who helped make this event possible. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our hosts for this afternoon, Vouye Acquier, Robert Sear, and Ralph Heinzman, les co-présidents du Committee de la Médaille Simons. Please welcome to the stage the co-chairs of the Simons Medal Committee, Robert Sear and Ralph Heinzman. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for joining us today for the award of the Simons Medal to Michael Inatyev. The Simons Medal is one of Canada's most prestigious awards. It, it is presented annually by the Confederation Centre of the Arts to honour persons who have made an exceptional contribution to Canadian life. Since 2004, 22 outstanding men and women have been honoured by the Centre through the award of the Simons Medal. Le laureat de la Médaille Simons 2023 est amplement digne de se joindre à ce groupe éminent. Michael Ignatieff a brillé dans des domaines multiples ici au Canada et sur la scène internationale où il a toujours fait honneur à son pays natal. Il profite de cette perspective mondiale aujourd'hui dans son allocution de la Médaille Simons pour nous entre entretenir du thème le Canada dans le monde, espoir, optimisme et le projet humain. At the end of the Simons Medal presentation and Michael and Natia's lecture, you're all welcomed to the lobby for the Premier's reception to celebrate. And now to provide a welcome and land acknowledgement on behalf of the Mi'kmaq people, please welcome Chief Darlene Bernard of the Lennox Island First Nation. Gwe Hakjalazi, Neen Delisin, Sagamau Darlene Bernard, Melkig and I, Gipuesk. I am Chief Darlene Bernard, strong eagle woman, proud chief of the Lennox Island First Nation. In keeping with my tradition, I acknowledge our elders who are in attendance, our sacred knowledge keepers, indigenous and non-indigenous. I want to acknowledge our visitors and guests and as well, all those who work behind the scenes to make these events so special. It is truly a privilege to be here with you all at this beautiful Confederation Center of the Arts for the Simmons Medal presentation, one of Canada's most prestigious honors. We begin this ceremony by expressing our gratitude to the Creator the spirit of our ancestors, and the land on which we stand. We acknowledge the traditional unceded territories of our people who have been the stewards of this land since time immemorial. Our connection to the land, waters, and all living things is an integral part of our Mi'kmaq identity, and we must strive to protect and honor it always. The Simmons Medal has a rich history of recognizing outstanding individuals who have made significant contributions to Canadian life, including Indigenous rights. Among the esteemed recipients of this award are several Indigenous brothers and sisters who have made remarkable contributions to our society, including Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon. 
Canada's first Indigenous Governor General, and the Honourable Marie Sinclair, former member of the Canadian Senate and First Nations lawyer who served as Chief Commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. These remarkable individuals represent the exceptional leadership within Indigenous communities and the powerful role that Indigenous people play in shaping our shared future. This year, we are recognizing and celebrating another incredible recipient who has made exceptional contributions to society and humanity and whose work embodies the spirit of the Sims Medal. I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on behalf of the Lennox Island First Nation and all Abiguetnawa to Michael Ignatieff on this incredible accomplishment. I look forward to witnessing the continued impact of his work and the inspiration it provides us in our journey towards a better future for all. Well, Alan, thank you again for having me here today. I hope you enjoy this incredible event and are inspired by the significance of this award. Please join me in honoring the 23rd recipient of the Simmons Medal, Mr. Michael Ignatius. Valadio, merci, thank you. Thank you, Chief Bernard. And now to bring greetings from the province of Prince Edward Islands, let's welcome the Premier, the Honorable Dennis King, to the stage. Uh, good afternoon, bonjour, quay. Uh, Jalasi Deloisi Dennis, Your Honor, uh, Antoinette Perry, Guest Lecturer Michael, Susanna, Chair Robert and Ralph, CEO Steve Bellamy, fellow MLAs and elected officials, Chief Bernard, Mayor Brown, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to be here as the Premier of Prince Edward Island uh, to welcome you uh, and to participate with you today at this wonderful venue we call the Confederation Center of the Arts for the 2023 Simons Lecture Series. This lecture series for the past two decades has showcased guest lecturers from the arts, law, science, politics, and journalism, providing a platform to discuss the current state and future prospects of Confederation. I do want to thank the Board of Directors uh, and the leadership team at the Confederation Center of the Arts and the family of Tom Simons, first for hosting this important event and also for their never-ending focus on sharing the best of this country through the unifying lens that is the arts. Uh, it is the desire and vision of the late Professor Tom Simons to provide this opportunity for distinguished Canadians to reflect upon the state of our country today to cast our gaze forward to the future of what we can become and to do it here where our founding fathers first gathered in September of 1864 to discuss the formation of this great country of ours. There is a sign inside of Province House where those first meetings were held that pays tribute to those who had the foresight, who had the courage to tackle the divisive issues of their time and that sign reads, in part, that they build it better than they knew. And for many years when I worked in, visited that building, I looked at that sign often and thought it served only as a recognition of their efforts and, of course, of our perpetual gratitude as a province and a nation for their vision and their determination. But as I get older, and I reflect more and more upon where we're at and where we're going, I think more and more that that sign is also a call to action for those who have followed and for those who are to come. That the work needed to build a country is also the work needed to grow a country and to maintain a country. The work and determination to do that work never ends. And there are times even when I allow myself to fantasize about those meetings, what it must have been like at that time, how difficult 
and divisive and emotional those meetings were. Uh, you know, be it the French and English uh, language sensitivities. Uh, at the time, there was the expansion and strength of the United States post-Civil War and the fears that annexation of individual provinces could be realized. And there must have been an underlying fear and concern with individual provinces of having to give away some of their own autonomy to be part of something bigger and different and better. They would have been difficult and challenging times. And there would have been those there whose only focus would have been to be on the challenges and the divisions. And maybe we're only too content to ask the simple question, what will this do for me? But there were those there who had the fortitude to look a little bit further, to probe a little deeper, and dared to ask, if we all work together, what could we be? Now, we have to acknowledge that much has changed in the world since 1864, but so much hasn't. We find ourselves facing the same fundamental challenges today, somewhat different perhaps, and like our founders, our job, ever so difficult, is to maintain our focus on what we can be together. Uh, we need to resist, like our founders did, taking that easy road that focuses solely on what about me, and to answer that call of action that the sign in Province House beckons, perhaps never since those times has it been more important that we do so as a country, uh, because our world and our country is becoming so much more fragile, facing so much division, perhaps at any time in our recent memory. The work and the determination to do the work is needed now as much as it ever has been. We need to answer that call of action, and I know we will. I do believe in the greatness of this country and I believe in the collective greatness of our citizens to maintain and grow Canada, to build it better and better so that it remains, in spite of all of our challenges and divisions, the best place to live, work and raise a family in the entire world. Our guest lecturer today shares these beliefs. Michael Ignatiev is a fierce defender of Canada who continues to promote the importance of our global responsibility to be a stable, caring, inclusive, social and environmental conscious that this ever-changing world needs. He has experienced our country and our world unlike few others. He has extensively studied our history. He has written and spoken about it throughout the world. As a journalist, he's interviewed world, political, financial and social leaders. As an author, he has shared his mind and his heart through fiction and nonfiction and he has spent most of his distinguished career focusing on protecting democracy throughout the world, enhancing human rights, promoting nation building, and stressing the importance of international development through community relations. In a moment, he will share with us his experiences, which are vast, and his thoughts on the Canada of today. And in the spirit of Professor Simons, who watches over us today, Mr. Ignatiev will look to the future and share with us his belief and hope for the continued growth and success of Canada. I want to thank you all for being here today and I look, look forward to sharing this lecture with you. Thank you, merci, well done. Merci, Monsieur King. Nous aurons maintenant l'honneur de présenter la médaille, médaille Simons 2023 à l'honorable Michael Ignatieff, qui a fait une contribution immense au monde des lettres, de l'éducation, de la radio-télévision, du journalisme, de la politique, entre autres choses. Ici au Canada, bien des gens le connaissent surtout pour sa contribution à la vie politique du Canada et son rôle en tant que leader national du Parti libéral du Canada. Mais ce n'est qu'une partie d'une vie beaucoup plus large, une vie remarquable qui lui a permis de devenir un intellectuel et universitaire de réputation mondiale. Michael has worked in teaching and leadership roles at Harvard University, the University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, King's College, Cambridge, and Central European University. He has also worked as a freelance journalist for the BBC, The Observer, and other outlets in the United Kingdom. He is currently Professor of History and Rector Emeritus 
at Central U European University in Vienna. Michael has been awarded honorary doctorates from some 14 different universities in Canada and abroad. He is also a member of the Order of Canada and the King's Privy Council for Canada. Historian, professor, écrivain, romancier, essayist, biographe, animateur de télévision, journaliste, chroniqueur, député, leader de parti politique, président d'université, Michael Ignatieff est un homme de tous les talents. En plus de trois romans, il a publié plus d'une vingtaine de livres qui ont fait de lui un des commentateurs les plus éminents dans le monde sur les droits humains, les conflits ethniques, ainsi que l'évolution et l'avenir de la démocratie, entre autres choses. Sa biographie de Isaiah Berlin est reconnue comme un classique du genre et d'autres livres ont exploré ses propres racines familiales en Russie et ici au Canada où quatre générations ont contribué avec grande distinction à la vie publique et intellectuelle du pays. C'est pour reconnaître tous ses mérites, une vie publique et professionnelle exemplaire, l'excellence de ses multiples contributions intellectuelles, littéraires et politiques, et la façon dont Michael a su rehausser le profil et la réputation du Canada dans le monde, que le Centre des arts de la Confédération se fait un honneur de lui accorder aujourd'hui la médaille Simons 2023. Michael and Nadia is joined this afternoon by his wife Susanna, and we are so glad that you were able to be here for this very special occasion. And now we are pleased to present a few virtual messages of congratulations from some very special guests who could not be with us here in person. Let's have a look at those now. Michael, it's almost embarrassing to say how long we've known each other. Uh, we first met back in the mists of the last century. I've been reflecting on your work, uh, on your observations on identity, loss, loss of memory, loss of loved ones, the cost of war, and the need for consolation. You brought a Canadian perspective to the world and an international perspective to Canada. Congratulations on winning the Simons Medal for 2023. Michael, congratulations on an incredibly well-deserved Simons Medal. I am so grateful for your thoughtful leadership your remarkable intellect, your fierce defense of human rights, and your years of dedicated service, and also for your friendship. J'aurais voulu être là pour fêter l'événement, mais je vous envoie à vous et à Susanna mes meilleurs vœux. Congratulations. Félicitations. Hello, Michael. Congratulations on receiving the 2023 Simons Medal. So well deserved for your love for and insights into Canada and the world beyond. I remember so well our very first meeting. I was working at Penguin and we were going to publish the Russian album. Such a brilliant combination of history and a personal search for identity, a subject you continue to explore through all of your writing. We were all so proud and you said you were chuffed when that book won the Governor General's Award for nonfiction. It was always a pleasure to edit your books and an even greater pleasure to discuss your ideas and your thinking together over a drink or dinner. I always learned so much from you and felt my mind expanding every time we talked. And later, I was able to just read and enjoy your books. Your wide-ranging knowledge so impressed me, resulting in works from nationalism to consolation, from human rights to the ache of Alzheimer's, all with your touchstone, compassion, intelligence, and keen moral sense. All the best to you, Michael, and again, congratulations. I'm very happy to be able to pay tribute to uh, Michael Ignatieff. He's been uh, 
long time close acquaintance and friend. Um, we've even written a book together, uh, the title of which neither of us will ever tell you about. Um, on a personal level, I happen to know he's very good at cooking roast chicken, but that's that's not what we're here today for. Um, is to pay tribute to the clarity of his voice and the um, tenacity of his of his political convictions. It is so needed today. Uh, it's almost unbelievable. That voice is really important. It's at the center of, of what we need to hear more of. We're not hearing that voice enough. And, and it's lucky for all of us that Michael Ignatia exists. I, I wish him the best. Um, he's a great, great candidate for a Tom Simons Award. Um, they, they are kindred souls. I hope I am too. Congratulations, Michael. Michael, congratulations on the Simons Medal this year and being the Simons Lecturer. I'm thrilled for you, I'm thrilled for us. I think with the career that you've had in the arts, in politics, as an award-winning writer, as a creator, a generator of ideas, this is absolutely fitting. I'm thrilled you're receiving this honor and you've made such an amazing contribution to Canadian life. Thank you for, as a brilliant writer once put it, helping us find solace in dark times. Congratulations, cousin. It's wonderful news. J'invite maintenant à son honneur Antoinette Perry, lieutenante gouverneur de l'île du Prince-Édouard, à monter sur la scène et se joindre à nous pour la présentation de la médaille Simons 2023. The Confederation Center of the Arts is proud to present the 2023 Simons Medal to Michael and Nadia. Wow, uh, wonderful to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure to be in PEI again. Some of my best days in politics were spent in this province. I remember uh, a day on a farm west of here when, when the family named a newborn calf <laughs> Susanna after my wife. And I uh, remember a wonderful afternoon in a harbor, astern on a fishing boat, drinking a beer with the captain and enjoying a dozen Malpecs. Uh, don't let anybody tell you politics is a dog's life. It means a great deal to receive the Simons Medal. And I want to thank everyone, especially Ralph Heinzman for making it happen. There's a little known fact. I once played Ralph's daughter in a high school production of Pirates and Penzance. <laughs> I looked pretty good in a wig and I had a nice little dress. It was fabulous. And I have been an admirer ever since of the public servant, writer, and thinker that Ralph has become. I never knew Tom Simons, but I have led a university and so I have some idea of what it must have taken for him to have created Trent University from nothing and to have led it for more than a decade. He left a legacy of creativity and leadership in our public life 
that we celebrate today. And he couldn't have done it if he hadn't had hope. And hope is my theme today. Where it comes from, how we lose it, how we get it back, both in our private life, but above all, the public hope that we need in our political life. Hope that our children's lives will be at least as good as ours have been. Hope that where anyone's lives are being held back by injustice or poverty or lack of opportunity, that our politics can generate solutions that unlock hope for all of our people. And then, most fundamentally, hope that humanity itself has a future. And I'll be talking a lot about that last dimension of hope. Now, hope is often elided with optimism, so confused with optimism that hope's getting a bad name. But they're not the same. Optimism is a kind of mood. Hope has an objective. If you're an optimist, you're kind of like Charles Dickens' Mr. Micawber, who is always waiting for something to turn up. Um, but you can be optimistic without being hopeful. If you're hopeful, you believe something will turn up, something will happen, and you will try to make it happen. It's objective directed. Sometimes uh, having hope is easier said than done. You can have hope, for example, that the Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup one day. <laughs> this is a classic case of hope against hope. But we all admire anyone who holds on to a dream, even when they come from Toronto. So we, uh, we create hope every day, you and me, when we give ourselves objectives and when we realize them against the odds, when we help others to achieve goals they couldn't reach on their own, and when, we help, and when they help us to do the same. Hope is a team sport. And when we work together to create hope, we can end up astonishing ourselves. And we pass on hope to our children by the way we raise them, and especially when we tell them not to wait for something to turn up, but get a plan and stick to it. Our nations, our political communities should be bearers of hope, and Canada has been a bearer of hope since it all started here in 1864. And the Premier, just a moment ago, evoked, I think, just how extraordinary it was to have the hopes that those Premiers had in 1864. It wasn't a done deal. It wasn't certain at all that Canada would survive and prosper. If those great leaders came back and stood in this room right, right now, they would be astounded at what they created. They created hope when they weren't certain that it would work out. Look, look at us here. It's a moment of, to think with gratitude of our founders and the hope that they had in us. I have hope because my dad came here to Canada as a 14-year-old refugee from Russia in 1928. Eight years later, he won a Rhodes Scholarship from Ontario to go to Oxford. And he joined the Canadian Foreign Service and worked with Vincent Massey in the High Commission in Canada in London during the Blitz and the V2s. He came back, worked 30 years in the Canadian Foreign Service, worked in the glory days of Lester B. Pearson, uh, when Canada found a place in the world as a model multilateralist, a reliable ally, an economic powerhouse. <clears throat> and so I grew up in a house that simply never doubted that Canada would make a difference in the world. And, I grew up in a house where my mother sang Judy Garland songs and uh, filled our lives with jokes and taught me and my brother to love poetry, painting, literature, and our country. And so if Canada remains a hopeful country to me, it's because it remains what it was for my parents, a place where you make a new start. You leave desperation behind, you get a good job, start a family, and join a community, above all, that gives you belonging. And I grew up in this hopeful country. Maintenant, quand je vais aux réunions en Espagne, ou en Belgique, ou dans la ex-Yougoslavie, et les gens me demandent, comment le Canada avez-vous pu résoudre vos problèmes d'unité nationale? 
Et je dis merci pour les compliments, mais c'était jamais facile. Notre référendum en 1995, c'était un cauchemar, comme on dit en anglais, a near-death experience. Mais le défi de maintenir l'unité nationale du Canada ne cesse jamais. C'est un travail de tous les jours pour, pour nous tous. Mais oui, ce que nous avons commencé à Charlottetown en 1864, de faire une communauté politique des francophones, des anglophones, des systèmes de loi, de religion, ça nous a donné beaucoup d'expérience à construire un pays d'une multitude de différences. Et je suis fier quand je voyage par tout le monde et les gens viennent me, me demander « Comment avez-vous réussi à maintenir l'unité nationale de votre pays ?» Je le dis, c'est nous, c'est ça le Canada. Ce travail acharné de maintenir ce que nous avons créé ici à Charlottetown il y a une centaine d'années. So life abroad has taught me how lucky I've been to be a Canadian. I was lucky because my generation, I'm a baby boomer, knew some great leaders. Uh, I remember listening to Martin Luther King. I listened to Bobby Kennedy. I campaigned for Pierre Trudeau in 1968 and had that vision of a just society that we remember. And I've lived long enough to see a great leader like Vladimir Zelensky rally the world behind his fight to preserve Ukraine's freedom. And these leaders were bearers of hope. They taught me to understand what political hope is uh, and how you keep it alive today. So if you ask me now, how did you have that crazy idea to go into politics? Couldn't you see you weren't cut out for it at all? <laughs> my answer would be, you had to know my parents. You had to know the leaders who inspired me. You had to know that I grew up in a family of public servants. You had to know how hopeful I was about coming back home and doing something for the country that had given me everything. Kind of funny now as you look back on it. But let me tell you, if there are any bright young people in this audience listening to me and thinking, I'm not going to make his mistake, let me tell you something. Make my mistake. <laughs> Put your name on a ballot. Throw your hat in the ring. I didn't get there, but maybe you will. And when you do everything I tried to do will be worthwhile. What matters is not whether we succeed or fail, but whether we inspire others to try. My political career didn't end as I hoped, but I don't regret any of it. And yes, I would do it again, only this time I'd win. <laughs> you may be disappointed if you put your hat in the ring. But what's the worst that can happen? You lose, you experience defeat. But is that really the worst? I'll tell you what's worst. Getting to the end of your life and realizing you never tried. A life lived without a challenging objective isn't a full life. It's a life without that kind of ultimate hope and we need that hope to live life to the fullest And our politics needs hope if our democracy is to hold the allegiance of our people. And so my question for you is, where's the hope gone? We meet in a dark time. Two democracies, Israel and Ukraine, are fighting for their lives. To the south of us, another democracy from which we've learned so much is beset with paralyzing polarization. Our own democracy has its own set of worries. We ask ourselves whether our federal union is becoming less than the sum of our parts. Are we keeping faith with the dream of Charlottetown or are we losing it? And when we think about our economy, are we working longer hours but producing less? And how do we produce the wealth, the innovation and growth that we need to sustain our vision of justice and opportunity for all? I think right across the democratic world, Hope is draining from our politics. And we're even asking a new question for the first time, at least in my adult life, which is whether there is a future for us at all. Let me tell you a story. Twice in recent months, I've been at conferences that discuss the climate change crisis. 
And in both, a young woman in her 20s stood up and said to the group, I no longer want to bring children into the world. And some of the young people in the audience applauded when she said that. But the rest of us went quiet. It was a moment that made everyone stop and think. These young women are not alone. Many now say that not bringing children into the world is the only thing they can do to make a difference. But that sounds a bit desperate to me. I mean, there's some very good reasons why birth rates should be falling, and chiefly the increase in women's freedom, which we all celebrate. But there's some troubling reasons for the fall in our birth rate, and one of them might be women telling us that their faith in the future has collapsed. And it's not just climate change, runaway artificial intelligence, the threat of nuclear war since Putin's invasion of Ukraine, a war in the Middle East that spreads massacre and despair through the whole region, and after the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, <clears throat> a fear that democracy itself may collapse. These are more than discrete challenges, and the feeling these women expresses goes deeper than fashionable disillusion with political parties, leaders, and corporate CEOs. Our leaders and parties all preach optimism. That's what we do. We all offer our own projects of hope. When I was a party leader, I set out my stall like the best of them. But now it's only too evident that young people aren't listening to us anymore. And they're asking a new question. Do we have a future at all? That's what's new. The apocalyptic feeling that we face an existential threat as a species. And this is strange new terrain to think about. Until now, our faith in the future has been resilient in the face of misfortune, folly, and catastrophe. Throughout history, we've carried on safe in the belief that someone coming after us will take up where we left off. And human beings have always undertaken seemingly impossible tasks, building great cathedrals, sending spaceships to the outer edge of the galaxy, knowing that the work that they start will be finished in the afterlife, in the unknown generations that will come after us. And this is the faith that has sustained hope for millennia. And what's new is this fear that there may be no afterlife at all. Now my generation, the baby boomers, had plenty of faith in the future, but we'd already made our careers by the time soaring inequality, economic uncertainty, COVID, climate change, and war began to disrupt the expectations of the next generation. And now, you know, someone like me is drawing up, I'm retiring and drawing up my will, and the next generation is going to inherit some of my money, but they're not going to inherit my confidence. I'm not surprised that the next generation is more pessimistic than I am, but compared to my parents' generation, the one just behind me, the despair of my children and grandchildren is puzzling. Because if you think about it, in 1945, the women of Berlin, Hamburg, Dresden, Warsaw, had to rebuild their homes from the rubble. They had no idea what the future would bring. Their world had just collapsed, but they went ahead and gave birth to the largest birth cohort in the history of the world. So when the young women at these conferences that I've been attending announce they no longer want to have children, they're not just doubting whether they have a future, they're asking whether the past experience of their mothers and grandmothers has any relevance to them. And that's a key point that I want to emphasize for you. To lose hope in the future is to lose faith in the past. It's to stop believing that what our forebears managed to achieve can still inspire us. When these young women wonder whether to have children, they no longer look back at all those who gave birth throughout history when the future felt hopeless. When they fear that the latest technology is running away with their jobs and way of life, they no longer find reassurance in the unimaginable opportunities that technology has created time and again. When they fear that Putin may drag us into a nuclear war, they've forgotten we've lived with this threat for 80 years already. When they worry about climate change, they don't realize 
that climate science is barely, barely 70 years old and it already has given us the tools to adapt and remediate. When they despair about getting off fossil fuels, they've forgotten that we're already halfway through an energy transition that was strictly nowhere 20 years ago. And when climate activists dismiss climate conferences as just so much blah, 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 they're forgetting that blah, blah, blah is how democracies solve our problems. Remember, Premier? That's how we do it, right? We talk. That's what a democracy does. And we talk until we get it right. My point is this. When people say that the past is no longer a guide, they're abandoning the chief source of hope for the future. But this is, a, this is complicated, this thought. We should listen to the past, we need to learn from the past, but we also need to hold on to the fierce belief of our forebearers, the belief they had that they could overcome the dead weight of their own inheritance, the injustices that were made to seem like unbudgeable natural facts, that ignorance and prejudice that just seemed incorrigible. So we're heirs both of the past and of our ancestors' rebellion against the injustices of the past. And I hope we can stay true to both of those impulses. In particular, I hope we can work ourselves free from the ideologies of the past, from the doctrines and dogmas that keep us from seeing the world anew. Learning from history doesn't require us to believe that it's always been a story of progress. Sure, there's been technical progress, but moral progress? Not so sure. Learning from the past doesn't ask us to forget that the past is often a story of terrifying discontinuity. It doesn't ask us to be blind to the huge price we've paid for capitalist development. It asks us, however, to, to see the world as it is free of ideological blind spots, to understand, for example, that while capitalism is definitely part of the problem, the speed with which capitalism's price signals can channel capital towards sustainable technologies makes capitalism an essential part of the solution. Now, now young people, and I hope there are lots of you in the audience, won't appreciate someone my age telling them to learn from the past, to cheer up and look on the bright side, to think as I do looking back that it's often been worse than this. Their despair is real enough and their diagnosis of the challenges we face isn't wrong. But here's the thing, we need to think of hope and despair not as opposites, but as dialectical twins in constant dialogue with each other. Hope accepts the diagnosis of despair, its description of reality, but refuses its prescription its fatalism, its desperation, its hopeless irony, because it's despair that rouses us to hope. We don't know how the future is going to turn out, and we never have, but we can be pretty sure it'll be worse if we abandon faith in our agency, if we give up trying to use science to find solutions to our problems, and if we end up believing no answers are possible. The first step towards hope is identifying what's new and what we can't put off any longer. And what's new, and we can all feel it, is that we face existential threats on a global scale. On a scale that's grown too big for our national political systems to manage on their own. And the chief challenge to Canada's position in the world is that we face problems like climate change, which we can't solve on our own. And so our politics has to go global and go global in a hurry. We need to be leveraging our partnerships, our friendships, our credit in the world to mobilize those global coalitions of the most powerful states and corporations to do what has to be done. <laughs> the fact that we can't solve many of our problems inside our political systems alone shouldn't be a council of despair. But it's a call to what we've been doing since Pearson, since Saleron, making coalitions, building, uh, coalitions of the willing, we've been ideas people in the international system, and we've been a good example that other countries want to copy. None of this is easy, but to paraphrase Samuel Johnson, 
Nothing concentrates the mind like the prospect of being hanged tomorrow. <laughs> if the threat of climate change, if the, if, <laughs> Sam Johnson would just love the idea. He was getting a round of applause in Charlottetown, PEI, two and a half centuries later. That's wonderful. Um, if the threat of climate change is existential, if even the most powerful states can't hope to survive if they go it alone, if even giant corporations realize that their business models might mean the end of humanity, then sooner or later, and we pray it'll be sooner, they've got no choice but to sit down, negotiate agreements, save energy, share data, control technology, and limit weapons so we can all survive. Canada can't make this change happen on our own. But we can show that a leading fossil fuel producer can transition to a sustainable energy production. But let's be honest, we are nowhere near where we need to be. We're back, back in the pack, lagging behind other countries in meeting our climate change targets. And we know why, let's be real. Meeting those targets threatens to tear our country apart pitting energy-producing provinces against energy-consuming ones. And given our fossil fuel inheritance, given how cold it is in the winter, given how spread out we are, we've got no choice but to narrow the gap between our rhetoric and our performance and get a realistic path towards carbon neutrality. Nothing has done more damage to our credibility on the international stage than virtue signaling that isn't backed by performance. Because we all want in this room, whatever your party, for Canada to be a serious country. We've been so once and we can be a serious country again. And a serious country does hard things. And after those northern fires that we all watched sweeping that, that uh, smoke through our cities in the past five years, we really don't have a choice anymore. So to make it happen, we can't wait for political parties and their leaders. I've been one, so I wouldn't advise you to wait for us to wake up. We, we need a popular and peaceful politics of hope from the bottom up at sufficient scale and persistence to push powerful actors to do so. All of us are dismayed by what the social media has done to our politics, but social media is a powerful instrument and it does transfer power down to people and enable them to create from the bottom up the platforms at the scale and the speed we need to force change. And already this global politics is creating fashions, movements and trends that are forcing our political systems to respond. The trouble, I think, is that those who are best at using the new media so often use it to spread a politics of paranoia and doom. The green movement, now you're not gonna like this sentence, the green movement too often crushes hope instead of keeping it alive. And you know, frankly, I'm no longer listening to people telling me we're done for. I'm listening to the people who tell me, here's how we dig ourselves out. Now, Václav Havel, a man I tremendously admire, a Czech dissident who became the president of his country, said a great thing, which I hope you will take to heart. He said, hope, quote, is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Overcoming existential risk is gonna require us to take great risks ourselves, and we will only take them when knowing they are the right thing to do makes them the only thing to do. There are plenty of opponents of change but who will deny that climate change does present an existential threat. But facts, as they say, are stubborn things, and sooner or later, hopefully sooner, they'll recognize the seriousness of threat and they'll put their opposition aside because they want to survive as much as we do. We all want a future to hand on to the next generation. Only a tiny minority, the truly despairing, believe that the human project has been a waste of time. The rest of us, everybody in this room, I hope and believe, passionately wants the human story to continue. And hope depends on this sense of meaningfulness, not just of our existence, but of human existence in general through time. The hope we need, I think, is radical hope. Radical because it's willing to take risks. Remember what Franklin Roosevelt called for? Bold, persistent experimentation. That's what we need. And we need to, 
to take bold, persistent experimentation even when we can't be sure whether it'll work or whether it'll work in time. The American philosopher Jonathan Lear defined radical hope, quote, as a commitment to the idea that the goodness of the world transcends our limited and vulnerable attempts to understand it. And that takes us to a spiritual dimension. In the past, our belief in the goodness of the world came from the idea that there was divinity at work in the world. And for religious believers, and I hope they're believers in this audience, the despair about the human prospect is no mystery. Religious forms of hope have lost their hold on the imaginations of many of us. But only a callow atheist can be happy about this. The rest of us can ill afford to abandon religious sources of reverence towards the natural world. I was glad to see the chief's greeting this morning. Thankfully, we've rediscovered the aboriginal traditions that invest divinity in nature and remind us of our obligations as stewards of the natural order. We need to learn from these traditions as never before. And they're crucial to the idea of radical hope. If radical hope is what we need, let's try and understand what it does and doesn't mean. For two centuries, to be radical was to be a revolutionary. Antonio Gramsci, a great Italian Marxist, once spoke about pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And the revolutionary ideal sought to capture all the hope that was once expressed in religious yearnings for redemption. Our politics today has abandoned revolution. I think that's a pretty good thing. But, but in the process, it's abandoned hope altogether. Liberals like me, and this is a self-criticism, have filled the empty space where hope used to be with cautious pragmatism. But as the smoke from northern fires drifts over our cities, as the temperatures rise, as demagogues profit from the disarray in our politics, liberals have reason to worry whether the self-limiting authority of liberal states is equal to the challenge of climate change. Some think that climate change will force us to an authoritarian future. But what's the value of a solution to the environmental crisis if it delivers us up to tyranny? We must hold on to what liberals got right. And what we got right was a vision of democracy as power, checking power to keep the people free. That's the core of a liberal creed. But liberals have to have the wisdom, and this is very difficult for a liberal, we have to have the wisdom to understand we haven't got the monopoly on wisdom. Uh, it's, it, it, God knows it's difficult. Um, Exist existential threats have shown up, I think, how shallow and unimportant many of our party political battles truly are. We need to learn, if you're a liberal, from other tr political traditions and what they bring to the fight. Socialists have expressed a passionate faith in a future where no person is humiliated or oppressed where the economy serves the people rather than the other way around. And this remains the warm heart of the socialist tradition, and it's a wonderful tradition. <clears throat> but instead of reviving our faith in this vision, the 21st century left, at least the ones I see on my university campus, only offer a dark vision of capitalism propelling us ever downwards into worsening environmental degradation and inequality. And, and this very dark vision at the heart of the way a lot of socialists talk about the, the future leaves its believers unsurprised by the darkening turn of events, but it has the side effect of eliminating the key element of hope, which is faith in our political agency as individuals. Now, if you look at the conservatives, conservatives, there are many of them as concerned about climate change as, as any liberal or any socialist, and they're busy preparing their supporters for what's ahead of us. And no one wants a future which does not conserve what we love best about our values and traditions. So the conservative tradition is essential to a common fight against climate change. But too many conservatives want to cancel the present its plurality of voices, its liberation of women, its welcome to newcomers from around the world. Because there's no path to the future that's a return to yesterday. 
The one thing my generation understands is that our past wasn't always all that great. Those happy days when women had no control over their fertility, when Aboriginal citizens didn't have the vote, when gay people were in the closet, when Francophones were hewers of wood and drawers of water, these are not days we want to see coming back. Faith in the future means believing that some of the progress that we've made in the past 60 years, the changes that I've called the rights revolution, were as the Quebecois say, dans la bonne voie. They were a good idea. We've got to stick with them. We don't want those benefits of the right revolution, rights revolution turned back. And finally, whatever our politics, liberal socialists and conservatives have to band together to defend democracy against the revolutionaries of the far right. And we've seen what they can do. They're too willing, they're only too willing to burn down what remains of the liberal order and return us back to the authoritarian past of their dreams. On January the 6th, 2021, in Washington's capital, they staged a dress rehearsal. And it's up to us to ensure that we never see the performance. So where do we look for a hope that does not perish in violence or tyranny? It's by overcoming our par political parochialism and seeking a new vision of the future built from the best of our political traditions. But beyond that, what? If we can't depend on revolutionary faith or religious faith either, all we have left is faith in the institutions we have, the ones that check power to keep the people free, and faith above all in human goodness, or at least the possibility of it. And that may be why hope is fragile, because human goodness is fragile. Radical hope may be fragile, but it draws on a deep biological instinct in all of us, our innate desire to create life and pass it on, our passion to have an afterlife, to have someone coming after us. And this harnesses instinct to moral purpose, to our belief that the human project is meaningful and that we can still realize its promise. Because if you want a future, you must want it with every fiber in your being. You must want a world in which future generations shape their lives free of humiliation, exploitation, and shame, and continue the unfinished experiment of democratic government in a natural world capable once again of renewing itself without end. And this is where we should be headed. This is the hope, this is the utopia that I believe in. And, and the thing about it is there's nothing new about it. And that's what gives me faith in it. It's what Europeans have wanted since Pericles' speech before the tombs of those who died to preserve Athenian freedom in 450 BC. But Athens is not the only place our hope can come from. If we could just work free of our ignorance and cultural condescension, we could derive hope not just from the European heritage, but from the entirety of the human record, especially the Aboriginal understanding of our place in the natural world. We need to recover this wisdom and reconnect our ideals of the future to the immensity of the human project that stretches behind us because it's the record of the unfinished work of humankind. And this human project is the site of an argument that we have every day of our lives over what it means to be a human being, who counts as one, what we need to leave a decent life, what form of political community best assures our flourishing, and what human beings owe to the natural environment and to their gods. To keep faith with humankind, to live in hope, is to believe that whenever we are faced with something new, unimaginable, there is a human being who has been there before, who has imagined this moment and has lived it. Somewhere in the human record, there is a hint, a suggestion, an anticipation that can guide us, calm us down, help us to see clearly in the face of the terrifying unknown. 
We take hope from the past and we reproduce it in the current of our everyday lives. We learn hope from our parents, from any lived experience we may have, however small, of neighbors, families, families, local groups, political parties even, getting together and accomplishing something that when we started, we did not believe we could ever achieve. To have hope is to anchor your life in a sense of being part of a human project receding into deep time and continuing when we are long gone. We should see ourselves as tiny figures in a caravan traveling through the ages, like the pilgrims of old journeying in faith towards the holy city. And if we do, we can be reconciled to the ending of our own lives and our slow vanishing from the memory of those who knew us. Faith in the human project is both a source of hope and of consolation. It is consoling to think that human beings just like us have been as despairing, as fearful, and as at a loss in the face of the future. It is inspiring to know that we are not alone and we never have been. We are joined to the past in an unbroken chain of questions about what it is to suffer, to endure, to recover, to begin again, and to live in hope. And reconnecting the tissue that joins past to future, feeling again that we are part of a human project through time, this is what rekindles hope and what may give the next generation the faith to bring new life into the world <clears throat> and to persevere with the ever unfinished human project. Thank you. On behalf of the Confederation Center of the Arts, the Simons Medal Selection Committee, which Bob and I chair, and all of you here today, I have the honor to thank you, Michael, for your inspiring address on the occasion of this 2023 Simons Medal Ceremony. On a personal note, you will understand why I am myself delighted that you chose to use this occasion to remind us of the importance of the human virtues, and especially the virtue of hope. Among the seven classical virtues of the Western tradition, hope was one of the three highest. Writers like Thomas Aquinas called these top three the divine or heroic virtues. Be heroic because a virtue like hope can sometimes make demands that go way beyond our ordinary human capacity as Michael just told us. It can require the exercise of all the other virtues and especially courage. The virtue that allows us to overcome the threatening or discouraging obstacles on the road ahead. You rightly reminded us, Michael, that though they're often confused, hope is very different than optimism. Optimism is the virtue of the person who thinks that with enough hard work and a little luck, things might turn out okay, that fortune favors the bold, but hope is different. As you said, hope is a decision for goodness in the face of all the probabilities of evil. It's the hope against hope, as you said. Hope is a, optimism is a virtue of confidence. Hope is a virtue of trust. Optimism implies because of. Hope implies 
in spite of. And you reminded us, as did the Premier, that when the Fathers of Confederation met here in the fall of 1864, their dream of founding a new nation on the northern half of our continent was an exercise in hope. It was certainly not a time for optimism. The new nation to the south of us, as the Premier reminded us, the first great experiment in democracy and federalism, which we were hoping to imitate, was then being torn apart by civil war. In fact, the most murderous war in history. And closer to home, regional and cultural animosities had made the province of Canada, now the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, virtually ungovernable. Canada was born out of failure and of menace. Yet, as Michael and the Premier reminded us, uh, th those who met here in 1864 dare, dared to hope that we could do better, that together we could make something greater than before, greater than the sum of our parts, not because of, but in spite of. Mais seulement quelqu'un d'esprit de, fort négatif nierait que leur espoir, l'espoir de 1864, a été très largement comblé, non pas à cause de nos perfections actuelles, mais en dépit de nos imperfections. Il y a encore tant à, tant à faire pour remplir les espoirs de 1864. Tant d'injustices à corriger, tant d'inéquités à remédier, tant de demandes légitimes à rencontrer, tant de tensions à réduire. Nous commençons à peine à écouter les voix qui ne se faisaient pas entendre à la conférence de Charlottetown, les voix des autochtones, des femmes, des Acadiens, entre autres. And there are so many new dangers to be faced at home and abroad, including the meta challenge of global climate change that you talked about, Michael, and the return of a violent populist authoritarianism our parents' generation thought they had defeated, but which we now find confronting us again even within Western democracies themselves. Yet you rightly have encouraged us to face all these challenges, old and new, with the same spirit of hope, beginning, as you suggested, with our institutions. Democratic self-government, government of the people, by the people, for the people, is the greatest achievement of Western civilization. All the things that we most cherish flow from it. But democracy can't be just an empty word or a slogan. It's not even just the opportunity to vote. That can be an empty exercise unless it's embedded in and protected by a strong web of democratic institutions, the kind that, as Michael said, keep us free, that check power to keep us free, as he put it. Without strong institutions, a democracy will not be a genuine democracy, just a pretend democracy, an ersatz democracy, like so many in the world with which uh, you, Michael, have had first-hand experience, and I won't name them. It will not, cannot offer those other goods without which it's democratic in name only. Freedom under law, due process, an independent judiciary, protection from arbitrary arrest and prosecution, freedom of speech and assembly, separation of party and state, freedom from partisan government propaganda, respect and protection for political opposition, non-partisan professional civil and police services, and so on. So hope for a democratic future depends on appreciating and giving proper care to the condition of our own parliamentary democracy and all the institutions, legal, judicial, administrative, regulatory, and so on, by which it is supported and kept genuinely democratic, many of which are or should be at arm's length from direct political control to keep us free. Mais vous nous rappelez aussi, Michael, 
que l'espoir et, et la confiance dans les institutions de notre démocratie dépendent en partie de notre vision du passé. Ni le Canada, ni la démocratie canadienne n'ont point commencé ici, à Charlottetown, en 1864. Ils n'ont même pas commencé avec l'avènement du gouvernement responsable en Nouvelle-Écosse ou dans la province du Canada en 1848, ni avec l'Union des Canada en 1841 ou l'acte constitutionnel de 1791 ou l'acte de Québec en 1774. The parliamentary and legal traditions of which we are the heirs go even further back, beyond the glorious revolution of 1689, beyond the struggle between king and parliament that led to the English Civil War in the 17th century, all the way back, if you like, to Magna Carta in the 13th century. And that long tradition of liberty broadening slowly down from precedent to precedent is only the beginning. Only one of the government strands that we have inherited from our past. Il y a aussi les institutions qui nous viennent de la France, par exemple, et du régime français, y compris le droit civil. And we're just beginning to understand that the indigenous peoples had their own well-developed traditions of law and governance before non-indigenous settlers arrived here, traditions that can have lasting value for us today, especially, as Michael reminded us, their reverence for the land. You emphasize, Michael, that to have hope for the future, we need to anchor ourselves in a project rooted in the deep past and continuing after we are gone. That is true of the whole human project, as you said. But we Canadians can only participate in that larger project in our own time and place, and in the context of our own history. That's why this building and this Confederation Center of the Arts stand as a memorial to those who, in 1864, began the journey toward our federal union and the democracy we Canadians are privileged to share today. To face all the challenges of our future with the hope and faith that will be essential to meet them, we need, as you said, to reconnect the tissue that joins our past to our future. Thank you, Michael, for reminding us all of, the, of all of these things. And on behalf of all of us, I thank you even more for the life and achievements that we celebrate today and for which the Confederation Center of the Arts has awarded you the 2023 Simons Medal. Thank you for your public, intellectual, and literary contributions to Canadian life and to the life of the world. More than most Canadians, Michael, your life has made you a citizen of the world. But all the while, if I may borrow some words that Robertson Davies once used about another great Canadian writer, you remain a great countryman of ours, a man to thank God for. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ralph, and uh, thank you again, Michael, for your very inspiring speech today. Before closing, I would like to say that this event is, is supported by the Simons Trust Endowment Fund, which was created to help finance this lecture series and engage people from across the country. Please consider supporting the Simons Trust Endowment Fund by, no, by donation. Information is available on the Center's website or through the Development Office. On vous invite maintenant à se joindre à nous dans le lobby du Centre pour la réception du Premier ministre en l'honneur du lauréat de l'Emilie Simons 2023, Michael Ignatieff. Nous anticipons avec grand plaisir de vous revoir l'année prochaine pour l'attribution de l'Emilie Simons 2024, le 20e anniversaire de la médaille 
ainsi que le 60e anniversaire de, du centre et le 160e anniversaire de la conférence de Charlottetown. You are now invited to join us in the lobby for the Premier's reception and celebrate. Any students participating in the fireside chat, please enjoy the reception as well, and we'll welcome you back to the Hambly Boardroom at 3.30. On behalf of everyone at Confederation Center of the Arts, we thank you for joining us today for the 2023 Simons Medal presentation and lecture. We look forward to seeing you next year. À la prochaine. Thank <laughs> you.